the Lord is giving a gene genealogical synopsis of the universal population. Brahma is the original creature born out of the energy of the Supreme Lord, who is known as Haranyagada. And from Brahma, all the seven great sages, and before them, four other great sages, named Sanaka, Sanandan, Sanatan, and Sanatkumar, and the Manus are manifested. All these 25 great sages are known as the patriarchs of the living entities all over the universe. There are innumerable universes and innumerable planets within each universe, and each planet is full of population of different entities. All of them are born out of these 25 patriarchs. Brahma underwent penance for 1,000 years of the demigods before he realized by the grace of Krishna how to create. Then from Brahma came Sanaka, Sanandan, Sanatan, and Sanatkumar. Then Rudra, and then the seven sages. And in this way, all the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas are born out of the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Brahma is known as Pita Maha, the grandfather, and Krishna is known as Prapita Maha, the father of the grandfather. That is stated in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Om Ajnana Tumarandasya Yanantana Samadaya Chatsuru Nirita Nena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhukade Swayam Rupam Tadamayam Dadati Svapadantika Bandira Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakama Sri Guru Vaishnavascha Sri Rupa Sagrajatam Sakarana Ramuna Tantikam Tam Sajivam Sarvaitam Samadhutam Parijana Sarita Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Rana Krishna Padam Sahagana Ramuna Shri Vishakha Vitamscha Hey Krishna Kalana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Sapta Kanta Gauranke Radhe Vrinda Vanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patita Nam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sundravani Vashtyatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Translation again The seven great sages and before them the four other great sages and the Manus, progenitors of mankind, come from me. 
born from my born from my mind and of the living entity populated the various plants descend from them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we heard in the previous verse where Krishna was describing how different qualities came from him. Now he's describing their different living entities, how they also come from him. And Prabhupada's explaining how that so Krishna is giving a synopsis of the genealogical nature of this plant, the ge genealogical arrangement in this universe. So foolish people think that life comes from the lower species and comes up to higher species. But we see here in the Bhagavad Gita. Is describing that life comes down from the advanced species down to the lower species. The most elevated person in the universe, the most intelligent, is Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma is created first of all in the universe. He's created, he's created and uh, he's born from the energy of the Supreme Lord. You know, Lord Garbhodaksha Vishnu lays on the Garbhodak ocean and from his navel the lotus flower comes up and Brahma is born from the lotus flower. So we call Lord Brahma as Chaturmukh Brahma because he has four faces. Lord Brahma in this universe is a small Brahma. We are in a small universe. So we only have a small Brahma, only four faces. So Lord Brahma is created, first of all, from the energy of the Lord. And then it, he mentions, Lord Krishna mentions how others are born from his mind. And he talks about the, the seven great sages. The seven great sages, actually, they're all sons of Lord Brahma. They're all coming from Lord Brahma. But uh, we could say here, Lord Krishna says they're born from his mind. And the four other great sages, meaning the four Kumaras, the four Kumaras also come. And the, the four Kumaras, they were the first creations. They were the first beings to, to be created in the universe. The four Kumaras came first. Lord Brahma desired that the four Kumaras would help him in populating the universe. But the four Kumaras, after they appeared, they told Lord Brahma that, sorry, we don't want to do that. We just want to go for self-realization. We don't want to get involved in your business, of which is populating the universe. We don't want to do that. And the four Kumaras explained that they were going to stay young forever. They weren't going to grow up. So they had that, somehow they had that power that they could remain always young, looking like young children, four or five years old. So the four Kumaras appeared like that. And Lord Brahma could not stop them. He had to respect their right that they didn't want to get involved in material activities, which was Lord Brahma's duty. And Lord Brahma had to give them that facility, but he was feeling some anger towards them. And the result of that anger was that Rudra, Rudra came out from the head of Lord Brahma. So Rudra was born from the anger of Lord Brahma. Uh, and in this way, uh, Rudra appeared. Rudra is described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that he is the expansion from Sada Shiva. And Sada Shiva is a Vishnu form. He's actually made his own Vishnu planet in Vaikuntha. But there's other Sada Shivas there. So, so anyway, Sada Shiva is mentioned there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. 
in the Adi Lila. And uh, Advaita Acharya, who's a PhD tomorrow, he said that your joint form comes from Mahavishnu and Sadhak Lila. So these ma the, you have first of all the four Kumaras, and then you have Rudra, and then after that, then the seven sages appear. But you also have people like the Manus appear. Now, in one day of Brahma, there are 14 Manus. In one day of Brahma. So the first Manu in this day of Brahma was Swayambhuva Manu. And we hear about Swayambhuva Manu, how he was the father of Uttanapada and Priyabhata. So he was the first man in the beginning of the, this day of Brahma. And Priyabrat and Uttanapad, they were very powerful, both very great devotees. And Priyabrata, he was so powerful, he drove his chariot, he raised his island from, the, from between the universes, he created oceans between the between the universe. He and Uttanapada, he was the father of Dhruva Maharaj. So they were the two sons of Priyabrata, of Swambhuva Mana. And Swambhuva Mana also had uh, three daughters, one of whom was Devahuti. And Devahuti was the mother of Lord Kapila, who propagated the Sankhya philosophy, which is described in the third canto. So, you have not only Manu was born from Brahma, but also Manu's wife, Satarupa. She also appeared along with Manu. They both came together. And then in this way, they were sent with the purpose to help uh, Lord Brahma in his work of populating the universe. Manu, being the father of mankind, described here the progenitor of mankind. So, he, Manu, of course, you have the Manu Samhita, the law book for mankind. But Manu is also responsible as producing, generating population. Not a lot of population, but from Manu you have, you have Manu came from Brahma. Oh, Daksha. Daksha is also a son of Brahma. Now, Daksha, he is really a Prajapati. Prajapati, they're the ones who generate all the living entities. So, Daksha, he, he could produce a hundred thousand sons at one time. And then Narada Muni delivered, was it, or maybe it was 10,000. Anyway, some big number. First, first 10. 10,000 sons, and then second time, 1,000 sons. And Narada Muni took both the groups away, made them into Paramahamsas, not to go back, not to go into the, the material world. So Daksha was ang angry at Narada Muni for that, because Daksha had, his intention was to help his father to populate the universe. He's a Prajapati. And Daksha means expert. So Daksha was expert at that, at creating progeny. But after Narada Muni took all the boys away, then Daksha decided that better next time we will just have girls. So he didn't produce any more boys. He had girls, then daughters. And he arranged for the daughters get married to great sages and that they would produce different living entities. So you have people like uh, people like uh, Sati. Sati was the daughter of one of the daughters of Daksha. And she got Sati of course got married to Lord Shiva and then because the Daksha was very offensive to Lord Shiva. So Sati decided she didn't want to have any relationship with Daksha. And so she gave up her body. She started meditation and fire come out and burn her body. And she
she took birth again, she took birth again as the, the daughter of the Himalayas. And again, she became the wife of Lord Shiva. Because that's her position. She's the eternal consort of Lord Shiva. So like that, you have uh, Lord Shiva or Rudra coming from the, the, the head of the, the forehead of Brahma when he was angry. You have the four Kumaras, and the four Kumaras, they're, they're nice devotees, they're brahmacharis, nice Tika brahmacharis, of course, and they, they stay up in the upper region of the universe. The, the, the four planets at the top of the universe, above Swarga Loka, above the heavenly planets, you have Maha Loka, Jana Loka, Tapo Loka, and Satya Loka. Satya Loka means that's where Lord Brahma lives. And the four Kumaras, they're often in Tapa Loka, that's what sometimes also Jana Loka. And sometimes they, you read in Srimad Bhagavatam how sometimes they would appear on this planet. Or like when Maharaj Prithu was present, he would do great yagya sacrifices. So at that time, sometimes the four Kumaras would come there being so pleased with the scent. And Prithu Maharaj would offer prayers and they would also give knowledge to Prithu Maharaj. So the four Kumaras generally, they, they are engaged in meditation. They practice the Asanga Yoga system and they meditate on the form of the Lord. In the Brihad Bhagavatam Gita, there's a very elaborate description about Gopkumar. Gopkumar was a cowherd boy from Govardhan, and he got a mantra from his guru. And with the power of this mantra, he was able to travel. And he was able, he went to different places, higher and higher in the universe. And at one point, he went to Tapaloka. And in Tapaloka, the four Kumaras were there. And he met with the four Kumaras, and he heard the four Kumaras, he heard them speaking, uh, he heard, he heard, or discussed with them about which is the better process. Is it better, you know, to do meditation, or is it better to do chanting mantra? Just elaborate philosophical discussion for the four Kumaras. So, uh, Four Kumaras are the great jnanis, the Brahma jnanis, they have a lot of knowledge. But they became attracted, of course, when they went to Vaikuntha, they got stopped by Jayan Vijay. And at that time, they cursed Jayan Vijay to come down to the material world. And they said to Jayan Vijay, you're not fit to be here. That this is a spiritual world you're not fit to be here because you're 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 offensive. You're you're nasty. You're angry to us. And of course, the giant Vijay wouldn't let the four Kumaras into Vaikuntha. So the four Kumaras cursed giant Vijay, but it was all arranged. It was the plan of the Lord because earlier giant Vijay had been offensive to the goddess of fortune. It happened that on one occasion the goddess of fortune wanted to enter and they stopped her because they said Lord, Lord Narayan is resting, you cannot go in and disturb him. So she was angry at them also, so Jaini Vijay, they got punished for that, that's why they had to come into the material world and take birth. But they got the choice, either they could take birth as devotees for seven births or as demons for three births. So they thought better to be a demon and just take three births. Because if we go as demons, it'll be quicker. But if we go as devotees, seven births, it will take a long time before we can come back to the spiritual world. So they said, better we go and get it over with. We'll take birth in demon bodies three times, and then we can come back to Vaikuntha. So it was arranged, they took birth first of all as Haranya Kashipu and Haranya Aksha, 
it is some sort of duty. You can read about the, the pregnancy of duty in the evening, which the duty molested her husband Kashyapa and seduced him at, at, at an inauspicious time. And the result was she gave birth to these two demons, Haranyakashi Ku and Haranyaksha. So they were killed. Haranyaksha was killed by Lord Varaha. The Haranyakashi Ku was killed by Lord Nishamudu. And then they took birth as Ravan and Kumbhakarna. And Ravan, of course, is a Brahmana. He's born in a Brahmana family. As were, of course, Haranyakashi Ku and Haranyaksha. They were the sons of Kashyapa, they were also Brahmins. <laughs> Although they were demons, they're born, they were Brahm, born in Brahman, this Brahmana family. So Brahman and Kumbhakarni, they were killed by Lord Brahma. And then they took birth in Krishna Lila as Tishupal and Dantavakta. And Tishupal and Dantavakta, they were killed by Lord Krishna. So that was the end of their three births. And then they went back to Vaikuntha to take up their service as Brahman Bija. So in this way, uh, the four Kumaras were helping for the pastimes of the Lord. The four Kumaras. Seems that in every universe they have these people. In every universe there's Brahma. In every universe you have Shiva. In every universe the four Kumaras are. Now sometimes it happens that Lord Brahma and the four Kumaras are not pure devotees and they may not go back to Godhead. Now sometimes they go back to Godhead, but not every time. So it's described that in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, in the Kapila Shiksha section, I think it's chapter number 32, it describes there how that if, if, if the four Kumaras or Lord Brahma, if they're not pure devotees, if they have any kind of material aspirations, then they don't go back to Godhead, but they enter into the body of Mahavishnu. At the time of their annihilation, all the living entities who are not yet ready to go back to Godhead, they enter into the body of Mahavishnu. And they remain in that subtle form unmanifest form in the body of Mahavishnu. And then when the night when the, the when it's time for another creation, the, the, there's two types of annihilation. There's an annihilation at the end of Brahma's day, and there's another annihilation at the end of Brahma's life. At the end of Brahma's day, there's a partial annihilation, the lower plan. But at the end of Brahma's life, there's a total annihilation. So with the total annihilation, the living entities enter into the body of Mahavishnu. When it's just a partial annihilation, then they enter into the body of Lord Bhagavatam. And then they have to take birth again. They will take birth again. So the four Kumaras, they are also Mahajan, they're also authorities in the Vedic knowledge. Swambhu, Narada, Shambhu, Kumar, Kapilomano. So the Kumars, all four Kumaras, they're all pure devotees. They're authorities in the devotional process. And Lord Brahma is also pure devotee. Of course, he's the Adi Guru for us. And Lord Brahma, at the beginning of the creation, he did austerities. As described here, he did austerities for 1,000 years of the demigods in order to get the power to do the work of creation. And so he did all that at the beginning of the creation after taking birth from the lotus flower. He had the two syllables, ta and pa. And so he understood the meaning of this ta, pa. It's that we should do austerities. And he took that, he didn't know who was saying, he didn't know where the sound was coming from, but he understood it to be divine. So he took the instruction to heart and he did this austerity for 1,000 years of the demigods. 
is the very, very long time. But the result of this tapasya was that he became empowered to do the work of creation. And he was also initiated by the Lord also. Gayatri Mantra was given to him. And the Vedic knowledge was also imparted into his heart. So Lord Brahma performs many functions. And uh, one, one of the functions he does, he also produces these di the different projects for helping to populate the universe. So it's important that the universe is properly populated. And it's the duty of Lord Brahma to produce that, to, to arrange for that, under the direction of the Supreme Lord. As, as described here, Lord Krishna says, it all comes from him, comes from his mind, born from my mind, and of the living beings populating the various planets. They descend, they de the living beings all descend from these people. So in the beginning, Lord Brahma and then Lord Brahma's sons, the different sons, and sometimes he creates, just like Manu came along with his wife, and so they produced many children. And then the, I was telling you about the sons of Swain Uba Manu, Uttanapada, and they, had, they produced children. Daksha was the son of Brahma, he produced many children. Daksha, and then also and Kashyapa and Aditi, they produced a lot of different living entities, all came from Kashyapa and Aditi, Hare Krishna. So Kashyapa and Aditi, they were very active in helping to populate the universe. And then uh, the great sages, the great sages, they were married to people like the daughters of Kadama Muni and Devahuti. Kadama Muni and Devahuti, they had, they had nine daughters. So, they married nine sages, mentioned their seven sages. Anyway, you can understand something of the population of the universe, how it all became populated. The different living entities that all came about from the upper region down, not from the bottom up, but from the top down. So the more elevated, the more advanced living entities came first. There was no evolution from lower species. You know, modern theory, they give the evolution theory, life has evolved from the lower species. That is not supported in the Vedas. The Vedic evidence is that life comes from the higher species down. When we come into the material world, the spiritual world, they said we take birth in the upper form become even Lord Brahma. The first birth in the material world, he took birth as a Brahma. And there are an infinite number of Brahmas. There's infinite number of universes in the material creation. So there's an infinite number of Brahmas. Everywhere you have also Shivas, four Kumaras, they're all there. All right. Any question? The material world is just a quarter of the entire creation. Yes, right. The material creation is one fourth compared to the spiritual world. The spiritual sky, the Vaikuntha and Goloka, they make up three fourths three times greater than the whole material cosmic manifestation. So the material cosmic manifestation is just like one tiny portion. It's like a cloudy region 
and the vast spiritual stars. It's like a cloudy region. It's like you get one cloud in the sky. Clouds only cover a portion of the sky. But material world, in the same way, is like that. It's just one portion of the whole vast spiritual sky. The Paravyom, the spiritual sky. Yes, we say that the news of the spiritual world is so much. The people were complaining because Prabhupada's guru was printing a newspaper every day. So people were surprised that, oh, every day you print a newspaper? But he said to them, he said, well, look here, in Calcutta, there are four daily newspapers and Calcutta is only one city on one planet in one universe in the material world and the material world is one fourth compared to the spiritual world so my newspaper is the news of the spiritual world and so I could have a newspaper every second of the day. But the problem is there are no customers. So like that, he supported his uh, printing work. His printing work. The, his newspaper was the news of the spiritual world. We need to hear about what's going on in the spiritual world. We spend so much time hearing the, the Gramya Kata, the village talk, the mundane gossip of the material world, this flickering temporary world. We become so fascinating, fascinating and absorbed in the material things, which are so temporary. We, we, what we need to do is give our attention to hear about the spiritual world, about the nature of the kingdom of God and what's taking place there. So this is described to us in books like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to make these kind of books our newspaper instead of Instead of daily newspapers, they read about politics and, and mundane gossips of the material world. We need to hear about the spiritual world, about what, this, what, what the Supreme Lord is doing there. What's happening there? People have no idea. They don't know what's going on. They want to go there, but they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's happening. So we need to hear about the Lord, and we need to hear about his form and his qualities and his activities. And in this way, we can enrich our mind. And when our mind is full of thoughts of the Lord, then it will be, be easier for us to enter there, into that kingdom. Yam yam vahismaram bhavam chajate anti kalevaram. Whatever we remember at the end of life, that will lead us to the destination in the next life. So it's very important for us to be able to focus our mind on the proper thoughts at the end of life. And in order to do that, we have to practice. We have to practice throughout our life particularly in our older age. It's important for us to prepare for the end of life so that at the end of life we can fix our mind on a, an appropriate destination. We should understand that life is eternal. The soul is eternal. And death is simply the change of the body. 
You give up one body and you go and take another body, some other place. So we want to be conscious about where we're going to go to take this next body. And it will be decided by the activities which we are, we're doing in this life. The consciousness which we have. If we spend our whole day with the dog, taking care of the dog, in this life, maybe come the dog. So, there's even an example in Yamadar Lila, there were two devas. They were young men in the heavenly planets and they had to become trees and they had to stand as trees for a long time. So this, this kind of thing can happen. It's not that we always go up, but we can also go down. The human life is like a crossroads. Either you can go up or down or come back. Up, it's better than going down. To go down means to go into the hellish plane, into the lower forms of life, and to lose the valuable opportunity of the human life. The human life is very special. It's a responsibility. Understand about who I am, why I am here, where I am going. So these questions are important and we should want to know the answers to these questions. And we do get the answers very clearly in the Vedas, in the scriptures. We have to hear. So this is think about them. We don't always think what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. We just, we're just thinking, oh, it's all right. Just like meat eating, people are conditioned to eat non-vegetarian. They think, oh, it's all right. Everybody's eating it. They think, oh, there's so many restaurants, they're all selling it. But we don't think what is actually proper according to civilized society. So this is conditioning. We become blind. We become callous. We don't think about things anymore. Oh, it's okay, just eat. And people eat the most. They don't think about the poor animals, how they've been killed, how they've been tortured and killed. And they just sit and eat animal flesh. And they think, oh, it's okay. They don't realize that, no, it's not okay. It's sinful. And people get reactions to that. People may say, well, I didn't know. Well, the child doesn't know that the fire will burn. But when the child puts their hand in the fire, they get burned. And same way. They may not know, you know, just like you break, if you break the law, you have to go to court, you go to court, you can tell, I didn't know. Will the judge let you off? No, I don't think so. He's not going to let you off just because you didn't know. They say, well, it's your job to find out. So there are laws for living here in this world. And we have to, we should respect life. We should respect other forms of life. So killing, just like if you kill a person, it's a crime. It's serious. 
And same way you kill an animal, it's also a crime. You may say, well, it's not as bad as killing a person. Yes, but still, it's a crime. And you get the, you get the punishment. People go fast. The thing that is interesting is that uh, in a spiritual activity we do, we try to humble the mind without consciousness. Well, that's pure, purified consciousness. Other consciousness is contaminated consciousness. You could say conditionings, but it, I would think it's more purifying rather than conditioning. Yes, we, if we develop, if we practice uh, the spiritual path, then we will develop certain habits. Just like the habit of someone who is practicing the spiritual path, they wake up early in the morning. They have a habit. They get up early in the morning, take bath, and then do some mantra meditation like that. They develop these habits. You could say conditioning, but it's purification as well. The consciousness, the consciousness is becoming purified. Conditioning, it, it's more material conditioning. Conditioned to sleep late every day, stay up very late at night, watching movies, and wake up very late in the morning, and go and drink tea and coffee, <coughs> smoke cigarettes. You know, when the first thing they do in the morning, where's my cigarettes, where's my coffee? Like that, you know, that is conditioning. And for the devotee, the devotee's lifestyle is different. It's not really conditioning. It's, 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 it's purification. It's elevation. The result of the activities which the devotee does is elevation. He gets a better position. He's able, he gets up in the morning and he takes bath and then he chants. There's a the spiritual activities. And so that's not conditioning, that's awakening of pure consciousness. But when we speak about conditioning, we, we're becoming conditioned to materialistic life, to the life of the modes of nature. The modes of nature are binding us. But the devotee, the devotee, he is surrendering to the spiritual energy. Other people, they surrender to the material energy. They think, oh, I'm free. I can eat whatever I like. It's not freedom. They're controlled by the modes of nature. The tamagun, the rajagun is controlling them forcing them to do it. They're forced to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol and do all kinds of sinful things. That is the, the, the modes of nature force, forcing them. People think, oh no, I'm free. I do it because I like it. Actually, they're not free. They cannot stop. Ask them to stop smoking. Ask them to stop. They can't do it. They can't even give up drinking tea. So they're not free. But the devotee willingly surrenders to Krishna. The devotee, out of his own free will, surrenders to Krishna and engages in the service of Krishna. Chanting, worshipping Krishna, uh, hearing about Krishna, worshipping Krishna, becoming a devotee. And like this, the devotee does these things willingly. It, it's not forced, but it, because he's become so attracted to these things. Of course, you could say, well, people were attracted to their cigarettes and alcohol, but there's a big difference, you see. 
The cigarettes and alcohol are in the lower modes of nature. But reading the Bhagavad Gita and chanting Hare Krishna mantra and so on, that's transcendental. It's not in the modes of nature. It's above the modes. It's Shuddha. It's pure wisdom. So it's not conditioned. People don't realize how they are conditioned. They don't realize. They are thinking, oh, I'm sweet. I'm having a good time. You know, the alcoholic and the drug addict, they are thinking, I'm having a good time. They don't realize how much suffering they do. They don't. So we're trying to uh, bring people out of that conditioning, out of that unfortunate situation. We try to awaken them. The Vedas say, Kamasima Jyotirgama. Don't stay in the dark. Come to the light. So the light, the knowledge is like light. Where there is knowledge, then you don't have to be afraid of the dark. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 